Uh, good afternoon, folks. Um, my name is Rami Shami, and I'm a case manager for Kensington Health. I am outside. Take two. I am outside because what better way to demonstrate the creativity that us as caregivers have to engage in in present day uh, caregiving? It is actually I am actually on vacation this week. Um, uh, however, caregivers don't get a day off. And as such, um, I want to be in alignment with that because I am also an informal caregiver for two older adults, my mother and my father. My father is in a palliative trajectory. My mom has chronic ailments. And, and as the oldest, as customer in our, in our culture, it's up to me to provide uh, that kind of support. We still good, Don? Yep. All right. Um, as a profession, I am a case manager with... Uh, with Kensington Health, but I'm also a coordinator, an outreach coordinator with Lighthouse for Grieving Children. And I also work um, as a consultant uh, for, uh, for hospice palliative care across the province, do a lot of teaching. A lot of my work is caregiver support, caregiver education, uh, bereavement support, and end of life bed sitting. So sitting for people with people who are living a life limiting illness, especially at, uh, at end of life. But all of this I'm sharing with you because I recognize also that caregiving during a pandemic is exceptionally difficult. I can appreciate that. I work in the field, but I also provide support informally for my family in the field while caregiving for a child. So it is, it is challenging. It is definitely demanding for, for many of us in, in, in that respect. Um, I hope you you're all still it's all still uh, still good. Can you can somebody send me a message say we're all good? Ruth, are we still good? Yeah. All right. So in this presentation, folks, uh, I'm going to talk about how COVID has really disrupted and added stress to our lives, and I'm going to do it from outside because I I basically I live in a basement apartment and and most of my work is uh, at the office at Kensington Health. So if I can't walk the walk, then how can I ask other caregivers if they could take the time to be, to be outside? But COVID-19 has truly disrupted and added stress uh, into our lives. And in many ways, it's been immeasurable in the stress that it's added. Caregiver burnout and mental health, I mean, it's always been a concern, right? Especially for, for, for healthcare and social services. But now it's almost as if caregiving has, caught, has, has accentuated the sense of loneliness and isolation like never before in the history of caregiving. Um, from one perspective, I've heard from caregivers, a lot of what I'm gonna share with you is from caregivers, and some of it is formal, formal uh, 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 information. From one perspective, being at home has been easier for some caregivers if they're working from home or we're in stay at home because it eases, hopefully, you know, hopefully, uh, going into the office or going into workplaces uh, because we're working from home. Uh, employers have had to be more flexible, but that hasn't been in every case because the more we're at home as caregivers, the more we don't get a break, the more we don't have any, any chance to get out and be outside or do the activities or even engage in anything that would be constituting us care for ourselves as, as caregivers, let alone how everything has been shut down and, and stay at home orders. I mean, I, I barely be, can even come out today and, and to present and just to be outside and absorb some sun. But there's also very little time for a break because of the shortage of supports like personal caregivers, like day programs for older adults. There's this, also this fear by caregivers and rightfully so, including myself, even though I'm vaccinated, I'm still very careful um, of getting infected with COVID themselves because if they get infected, what happens to the person they're caring for? Or if they bring it home, right? If I go to my parents' home to provide some caregiving, if I bring it there, there's always this, this heightened sense of alertness or threat. And on top of that, you know, unfortunately, personal support workers, uh, any kind of outside help into the home is an added cost. And unfortunately, some organizations who are providing private personal care have, have increased their pricing because there's supply and demand. And in a supply and demand, there's a shortage of support and personal support workers. And as such, we have needed uh, more support in that way. Yes, yeah, so I'll move my bike away. I just wanted to make sure you folks can, can hear me. Um, so with the increased financial stress or burden, 
and the stay-at-home orders that we might not be going into workplaces. And if we add a little bit more to that, that even with the added financial stress and working from home, some of us are not able to work, we're on CERB, then it just adds to the financial stress. And the stress is immeasurable. It's said that 54% of caregivers in a study done by the Ontario Caregiver Organization in December of this year said caregiving is way more difficult now because of COVID. So let's look at some of the things of how, how things have changed. Let's take a look. Oh, you're very welcome, John. I'm glad, glad you could join us and, and uh, less plosives. I hear you. I hear you. This mic is really uh, uh, sensitive and it picks up absolutely everything. That's why I put it close to my mouth. Um, anyways, let's look at what has changed. Uh, caregiving, the responsibility of caregiving is in and of itself more time consuming. In balancing even the emotional and behavioral support or providing that for somebody we're caregiving, we have to provide transportation and tasks around the home, all within COVID. And if we add social distancing or physical distancing and the isolation and the restrictions, the, the consumption of time for a caregiver is enormous because we have to make sure, for example, if we have private care coming into the home, we have to make sure that they're wearing masks, that their hands are sanitized, or maybe temperature checks. They may not be able to show up. They may get sick. And that just adds. And, and what happens to caregivers? They have to step in where the private care has, or even you know the care provided by the government uh, in terms of the LIN, has, has not been able to, to, to come forth for whatever reason. And I think there's even a need, more of a need for respite for, for caregivers. Um, in that regard, if we have a financial burden and we have to do more with less because there's less services out there, there's actually a heightened need for respite for caregivers themselves. So it actually, it's double whammy. There's a, there's a need, there's, a, there's an added stress and an added taxing and time consuming of consumption of caregiving. And then on top of that, there is less services and more need for respite for, for caregivers. So it ends up being almost like a double um, challenge for, for, for caregivers. Um, all the concerns that are traditional and, and common for caregivers are amplified now during COVID. Trying to meet care needs during isolation while protecting ourselves, because I'm, I'm, I'm one of you in terms of a caregiver, both professionally paid and informally, uh, you know, unpaid. Trying to protect ourselves and trying to protect our families and the stress of having the threat of being infected with COVID while we're providing caregiving for a family member just adds to the sense of isolation. So I'm always thinking in my mind, do I go over to my parents to caregive for them? Can they handle it today? Am I gonna put them at risk if I come over? What should I do? Every day it's like that for me. And I can't imagine what it's like for, for, for most of you. It ends up leaving us as caregivers because also I, I can't, because of the isolation and, and the stay at home orders, I can't necessarily ask family members like my brother who lives in Aurelia to come down and, and to help or to friends who used to come over and make sure that my parents were taken care of if I was at work or especially in my job that's very demanding or that I had something for my child. So that leaves me very isolated. And I can only imagine it can leave you feeling lonely and isolated and even depressed on your parts because we're doing this really alone. We might've been doing it alone before COVID, but it's extra alone now during, during COVID. I feel there's even this increase um, after pan the pandemic is brought under control. And I'm not saying cured or stopped. I'm saying brought under control to remain optimistic and realistic that this will all continue. It's not as if we can stop the stress levels or you know, diminish the feeling of threat um, from a pandemic that is instilled in us and infused in us because of what has happened uh, during the pandemic. This might carry on. We might have the pandemic under control, but the caregiving needs and the stress and the burnout that's happened during COVID is not all of a sudden gonna go away. So that's another aspect that I, I, I feel we have to be mindful of, that this is in for the long haul, regardless of what the caregiving duties are. I know with my parents, they might live another 10, 15 years, but I have to be in it for the long haul because of, if I burn out now, what's gonna happen in a few years when pandemic is, is under control? And what I've heard from so many caregivers is that we are doing more with less. 
which leaves us feeling overwhelmed, which actually in many cases, and I'll be the first to admit it, may leave us feeling short-tempered, trapped, helpless, uh, even not appreciated. And again, I'll be very transparent with you, oftentimes resentful. Yes, there are moments where I actually feel resentful for the tax and load that I have on myself that takes away from my well-being and my child and my activities and my work for caregiving duties during a pandemic and a stay-at-home orders. It's, it's, it's um, even the more with less is that there's less services out there. There's less PSWs. There's no day programs that are really running or operating in person. Transportation is, is always a risk. Emergency surgeries or even, sorry, not emergency surgeries, but um, surgeries that are elective are, are postponed. So my parents have elective surgeries that have to be postponed, which puts their quality of life um, at, a, at, a, at a challenge. And all this is weighing on you and me, you know, well, not my parents on you, but my parents, my family on me. And this is assuming older adults because some people are caregiving for younger uh, younger adults. Some are caregiving for family members. Some caregiving are, you know, especially with cancer, it could be a child. It could be a teenager. It could be, um, I know some people that come to our caregiver group, uh, Caregiver Connect uh, on Wednesdays with Wellspring and Kensington. Um, they're caregiving for a, for a 23, 24, 25 year old or 30 year old as with Ruby and, and Gonzalo, you know, so it's it's it uh, the the magnitude in it of, of 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 caregiving during a pandemic is is really taking it to a to a new level and if i can reiterate uh, the financial impact we're incurring higher costs um there is uh, an element of of business to it there is an element of scarcity to it and so there's higher costs now we have to if you have private caregivers coming into the home, you have to most likely provide sanitizer, uh, some measures of infection control, masks. Um, these are all incurring costs, right? And if not for them, as for ourselves as well. So I know some caregivers have using up their entire savings. They're like, okay, I'll survive the pandemic, but my burden is what's gonna happen after the pandemic as a caregiver. And as I mentioned, private care is costing way more now. I can't imagine I, some of the numbers that I've been thrown at for private caregiving. Uh, I don't know who could afford them, right? But it's it's uh, it's the challenge. And also private caregivers themselves have to still work. So they may be working in a long-term care facility and doing private clients, which technically I don't believe is allowed by law, but it's I hear that from caregivers. Now again, to revisit working remotely, because as you can see today, I am working remotely <laughs> on vacation. Um, some have said their responsibilities uh, to, to work have become easier because they can work from home. But balancing work and caregiving responsibilities is very challenging. I can't tell you how often I hear people saying, listen, don't feel, don't feel, don't think I have it good because I'm at home now. That means I can't take a break. That means I can't turn it off because the person I'm caring for is right next to me or right in, in the other room. So even though I don't necessarily have to leave and come back if something happens, I can't necessarily turn it off. Work was my escape, right? Or activities were my escape. And this is assuming that employers are flexible, which not all employers have been flexible with caregivers during COVID. I talked to some caregivers and they're very much challenged with what's happening in their employment or their, in their, their, with their employers in providing accommodations to work from home or be from home while they're providing uh, caregiving. And most employers don't have, I mean, this hit us so fast. So who had a pandemic uh, protocol in place for employers in terms of policies? Very few. We didn't even have that, right, as a, as a social service organization. And so we, they don't have formal policies for flexing hours to deal with caregiving tasks. Most employers don't. Most employers don't have much of a bereavement leave either. But to formalize, I mean, it's moving forward now in terms of employers developing formal policies for, for employees to flex their hours for caregiving duties because of the explosion of the demand for caregiving duties. You know, we live, a, 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 the population is changing and, and especially with respect to, to and so the caregiving duties have become, you know, equal or, or if not more demanding than, than, our, than our work lives. And that's not even negating 
you know, uh, people who are retirees and, and supporting somebody that they're married to or living with. So what can we do? Uh, what can be done? I oftentimes feel, and this happened in our group last week at, at Wellspring um, in the evening, sometimes we feel, even as a care provider myself, that there isn't much we, we can do, but there is. There are some things, and, and for example, just today, with all the duties that I have as a formal and informal caregiver and as a parent, I'm outside. I decided to do this presentation, even though there's glitches and I I'm, I'm, I'm appreciate all your accommodations, I'm gonna be outside for the next hour, however long we have left, to absorb some sunshine because I need it. I need it for myself. But what else can we do? I mean, the, the paths today here in, in Stony Creek are full. I mean, the people are out there and socially distant and physically distinct, but I also hear from caregivers that they, they can't get outside. So here are some of the resources that we do have right now, folks, and I'm not sure if you're aware of them. I just wanna share them with you in terms of what they are. And I ask you to contact myself in Wellspring so that you can get the leads and, and, and support. I'm not just gonna dump information on you and say, hey, check the internet. No, we wanna, we wanna help you and support you and walk you through this if you need it. One of those supports is our Caregiver Connect group that meets once a week on Wednesdays, either during the day or in the evenings. Just check our check Wellspring website for the times because it alternates. First and third Wednesdays, it's during the evening, 6 to 7.30. And uh, the third Wednesdays, it's during the day, 1.30 to 3. But just for the exact times, check their website. And that's an opportunity for all of you to come and share your caregiving struggles and challenges and triumphs and insights and learnings so that we could create a sense of community. And even, even if you don't, we don't learn anything from one another in terms of knowledge, it's that sense of community. It's that sense of, I am not alone. I heard that so often in this Caregiver Connect group. At least I'm not alone. At least, you know, I have others who bring a sense of, you know, I hate to use this word, but I'm gonna use it anyways, a sense of normalcy or commonality to what we're experiencing. That I'm not a, the only one in this plight. And the irony of it is that, at least a third of Canadians, if not, you know, two fifths of Canadians are in the same plight as all of us in terms of providing caregiving duties, you know, or tasks. Um, there are a lot of great Wellspring programs, you know, mindfulness, what have you. I'm also running a mindfulness program at Kensington Health. We are more than welcome to come. It's on Tuesdays from 6 to 7.30. Drop me an email. I will leave you with my email. Uh, you could hear the kids in the background and you could tell you're outside. Uh, it's nice to hear the sound of children. Honestly, it's just, uh, it feels a sense of normalcy, to be honest. Um, but that's just me. Um, I, and in this mindfulness group, it's a, it's all caregivers from the hospice, from the long-term care facility where I work at, from the community who come and engage for themselves just an hour or an hour and a half of being present and being focused on their own state and their own well-being and themselves once a week. And sometimes that's just enough to turn off our fight or flight to lower our sense of hyper arousal. Um, I appreciate it so much because even though I'm facilitating this mindfulness group, I am able to gain some respect of well-being from the mindfulness itself because I have to practice mindfulness almost every day just to sustain myself. And with mindfulness, folks, it's really all you need is about five to seven minutes a day. And we all can, I think we all can manage that. And we teach that in this mindfulness program. So you're welcome to join us. And I believe Wellspring has a, has a has a program as such and these webinars are recorded there's a number of webinars we recorded that i facilitate indoors <laughs> um, that speak to other aspects of caregiving such as guilt such as the traumatization caused by caregiving such as um lgbtq plus and, and and caregiving there's a lot of aspects of caregiving on the webinars in these webinars on the wellspring website you might already know that and i'm speaking to you so uh you could check the websites, but there are actual provincial supports that very few people know about in terms of COVID and caregiving. Every year, the Ontario government does uh, a study called the, uh, by the Ontario Caregiver Organization. It does a study and provides feedback and stats regarding caregivers. The one it did in December of this year was really impactful because it was only, it was about COVID. It was called the COVID edition. And from that COVID edition, they developed a lot of resources, which I'm going to share with you right now, uh, verbally. And I hope, I don't want, I don't want to just leave it with you. 
So please contact me or Wellspring and I'll, I'll guide you through these programs and I can suggest programs and tell you how they work and what have you. But they develop these strategies and resources for, for you to use during, uh, um, during the pandemic. And one of them is actually the 24 seven Ontario caregiver helpline and live chat. It's one number that you can, you can go there and find out all the aspects of, of caregiver resources within the community, or if you would like to talk to somebody, because I provide one-on-one -on -one caregiver support, but there are other professionals. I'm not a social worker or a psychotherapist, but there's professionals that can be referred to that can provide a more in-depth psychosocial support through this chat line. And it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week that somebody will, will answer the phone, okay? Um, the government has also developed the Ontario, we'll call it OCO, uh, the Ontario Caregiver Organization has created toolkits for caregivers during COVID. And one of them is called the Caregiver Starter Kit. And another one's called Work and the Caregiver, a Balancing Act. So two cool uh, toolkits that give you structured strategies and resources of how to manage caregiving during the pandemic. So you don't have to hear it from me. This is the, you know, researchers in the government being able to put these toolkits together that you could look at in your own time and go through, or you can contact me or someone at Wellspring and we will walk you through it. They have another program called SCALE, S-C-A-L-E. What that stands for is supporting caregiver awareness, learning and empowerment. In the SCALE program, there's weekly webinars, such as the one that I'm giving you right now, that talk about some of the caregiver strategies and supports. But there's also online group coaching. So maybe not so much as a peer support, like we have in our group at uh, Wellspring in Kensington, but it's a group coaching, coaching caregivers through these very difficult, unprecedented times. And then they have one-on-one -on -one telephone counseling that can support you as a caregiver. I have many clients who I support one-on-one, -on -one, not so much in a counseling, but more in a peer support model. I'm a caregiver, I'm an informal caregiver, as I mentioned, and I could I could share experiences and, and, and walk along somebody else who's providing caregiving in a one-to-one -one capacity. But they actually provide, in this scale program, they actually provide counseling, psychosocial emotional counseling, which, which I do a, a actual part of it, but I can't call it counseling. And these are these these individuals are trained in, in as professionals in it. And then OCO, Ontario Caregiver Organization, has a webinar series, as I mentioned before. And they have a range of topics from uh, finances, how to manage your finances, which I know nothing about. <laughs> I don't know why. I just been horrible in my finances in terms of caregiver support. Um, but they also talk about privacy as caregiver and some of the challenges with privacy. And of course, caregiver wellness, which is my expertise. Um, I'm not financially well, but I'm very well caregiver wise and, 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 and what have you. But anyways, in these webinar series, you know, they have these, these aspects of, uh, uh, of support. They also provide COVID-19 tip sheets, um, which include, which is really interesting, I love the languaging, a contingency plan for caregivers who may have either contracted COVID or are thinking in the future of what life might be like as a caregiver post-COVID or as we bring the pandemic under control. They also speak more formally into caregiver mental health and uh, how to use technology like I'm doing today uh, more effectively. I'm not sure if I'm being effective today, but they teach also how to use technology more effectively. I know, you know, there's so many, There's we've learned during the pandemic how much we assume that we have barrier-free engagements. And what I mean by that, you know, we assume everybody can be on Zoom. Well, what about people who don't have internet? What about individuals or caregivers who are of a generation that may not know how to use Zoom? It's not that necessarily that user friendly or don't how to, you know, have a outdated computer or any of those, any of those technological pieces they can help you with uh, in that regard. Um, there's also a peer mentoring program, which is very similar to ours. And so it's good to have multiple peer mentoring programs. Uh, for the simple reason that they meet at different times, they have different groups of people, somewhat different objectives, right? Ours is, has a cancer focus, but others may not have a necessarily cancer focus because it may not be what you want to focus on in terms of your caregiver, caregiver challenges. And they also have 
other online support groups um, that you might be able to 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 engage with um, that um, may not ours may not necessarily align with you. We want to be able to provide as many opportunities for people to engage in uh, some kind of support group that uh, that it's not about you know the organization's fit, but it's about the fit for the individuals. Now let me check. I think we had a question online. Um, it's a, I'm going to provide the website and actually I'll send it to, thank you for asking that. Um, what I didn't want to do is just dump the website out there and, and the links and say, you know, good luck. I want to be able to provide the support as well. So I will share the link with, uh, with, with, um, uh, Wellspring and I'll provide it actually right now in a, in a, once we're done this, uh, this piece, but please feel free to contact me, uh, at Kensington so that I can help you through these programs if you so wish. Okay. So, yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, the other thing I've also heard from caregivers uh, is some challenges that they're having with the providers themselves, right? Um, what I mean by that is that, unfortunately, I've, I've heard from some care, caregivers that their providers are coming in and refusing to wear masks. They may not be sanitizing. They may have colds. Um, they So, unfortunately, there isn't, a universal standard for care providers, private care providers, especially coming into the homes. You know, I'm, I'm not going to get into the, the the human resource liabilities of it um, because I've had caregivers have to contact the organizations or even the LIN to say, why is your care provider not providing, we're not wearing a mask or refusing to wear a mask or not washing their hands or not using hand sanitizer. Yes, these things do happen, but they also have a toolkit. Uh, with the Ontario Caregiver Organization that's called Partners in Care Pandemic Toolkit. And it's designed to support the safe presence of caregivers in healthcare settings. There's also an accredited online training for care for providers of caregiving. So for people who are necessarily formal, but I'd suggest even informal caregivers take the online training so you know what you could coach or teach or guide your private caregivers in what they need to do, right? I think knowledge is empowering. And if you know something about what they should be doing or how they should be doing it, especially if you're not sure, if you're questioning, here are two pieces to it. One is the toolkit of what parameters they should be following in, especially if you are uncertain of what, how they should be engaging uh, the person you're caring for. And there's an online training that you could take or ask the providers to take or ask the organization who's sending the care providers to take. Now that all being said, uh, I do wanna bring one other measure to your awareness. And I've talked about this before, but I feel I really need to reiterate it. And that is the fact that a constant threat threat of a virus out there, an invisible thing that could infect us, change us, harm us, har be transmitted to someone we we're caring for, can be a form of trauma, can be a form of traumatization because the constant, it's been a year now, of this constant veil or bubble of threat the world has been experiencing. And to be in a constant state of threat in this, 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 this imposing um, vulnerability, you might say, can cause our sympathetic nervous systems, which is the fight or flight response, or what we call the adrenaline response, to be on constant activation. And if it's on constant activation, we have this hyper-arousal mode that we're always on. So it ends up when we're always on and our sympathetic nervous system is always triggered and we're always in this fight or flight is that it takes away what's called our parasympathetic nervous system or part of our nervous systems that is focused on sleeping, eating, digesting, resting, having sex, thinking in terms of if work and, and education. And that's what actually can burn us out. That's why caregiving during a pandemic is a little bit different, a lot different than at any other time in human history. Caregiving during a pandemic is leaving us in a state of fight or flight. 
we need to find ways such as mindfulness meditation, such as the, the resources that have been put forth by the Ontario Caregiver Organization to lower that fight or flight, to dissipate it, to kind of bring down our hyper arousal through some measures, which I'll, I've spoken to more clearly and, and more, much more articulation in caregiving and traumatization webinar that is on the Wellspring website so that we can sleep, so that we can rest, so that we can digest, so we can get nutrients. So we can actually, when we do something that's self-care-ish, such as going for a walk, we're still not in hyper arousal because there's no point going out for a walk or going for a swim or doing anything that's of a self-care nature if we are still remaining in this fight or flight hyper arousal without even necessarily recognize it because it could leave us you know in, in, in an exasperate exasperated stress response to our caregiving it's it's like taking caregiving and pressurizing all the experiences this is what covid during caregiving during covid is actually doing caregiving it in a way that it turns all the stressors that we have to full response uh, reactivity. It makes it much harder, right? And that's why you might be experiencing for the first time, I've heard this from caregivers as well. Oh, I was doing fine until COVID hit. Then with the threat of the pandemic, the threat of COVID and all the avenues with which to dissipate our caregiving uh, uh, stress and the lack of the decrease in resources and the financial burden, it takes that experience, that stress, that response to being a caregiver and just multiplies it. And, and, and that in itself and an awareness of that has helped a lot of caregivers and not feel that they've failed during COVID. I've heard that from caregivers as well, that they feel that they've failed as caregivers because they're not managing. Well, they're not recognizing necessarily what they the only failure in there is that they may not be recognizing it. It's not a failure that the pandemic and all that's been curtailed and cut off due to the pandemic has caused caregiving to be not an impossibility, but feel like an impossible endeavor, you know, with all that's been, been taken away. The other things that it leaves us, it can leave us leaving edgy, anxious, nervous, short fuses. And then where does that often end up? It ends up being projected or, or, or put on the person that we're caregiving for. And I've heard that from caregivers as well. So I hope you can be just be somewhat um, uh, of, of some mindfulness of, you know, the, the, the pressure that, that um, COVID has caused in terms of, uh, of caregiving. It's, it's just caught, put it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pressure valve. Now, let me just reiterate, I'm going to look up the website for you right now and provide it for you um, in terms of uh, the Ontario um, uh, uh, Caregiver Organization. Just to reiterate, there's a 24-7 uh, Ontario Caregiver Helpline. There are toolkits such as the Ontario Caregiver Starter Kit and uh, the Work and Caregiver uh, a Balancing Act. There's the... Um, the SCALE program, Supporting Caregiver Awareness, Learning and Empowerment, which are weekly webinars, uh, such as the one we do of online group coaching and one-on-one -on -one telephone counseling. There's the webinar series, especially when it comes to privacy and finances and caregiver wellness. There's the COVID-19 tip sheets, okay? Especially when it comes to caregiver mental health and technology, how to do technology. So much, so much of the resources towards caregiving is missing the technology piece. How do I come onto a Zoom group? You know, how do I, how do I access webinars? How do I even log in to such such platforms? There's a peer mentoring program because there's something special about a peer mentoring program, right? It's with what is meant by peer mentoring is that other caregivers who are experiencing the challenges of caregiver can relate to somebody else who's caregiving. They may not completely understand what the other person's going through, but they can relate, such as myself and the people that I support in caregiving, because I am a caregiver. In in the broadest sense uh, as such. There's the online support groups, right? If ours doesn't meet your needs. And then for navigating those with, with navigating the challenges with providers, there's the Partners in Care Pandemic Toolkit, you know, and then there's of course the online training um, for uh, caregivers as partners. That is all available folks on the Ontario 
caregiving organization website. Just type in Ontario caregiver organization. Um, dot com and then you should be able to receive that i will send this link and actually what i'll also do folks i'll send the report the actual report from the ontario caregiver organization to wellspring i'll send it to Susie and vanita and, and don um to share with you folks in terms of these these resources i think the more resources we can share uh, the better the better it is for all of us with that being said i'm going to open up uh, the chat if you have any questions please feel free uh, you could type it into the chat or you can write it in the question and answer. I'll be on for the next five or seven minutes and then I'm going to continue my vacation and go enjoy the sunshine. So if you have any questions, please feel free. I'm going to be on for the next five to ten minutes to answer any of your comments or questions. Oh, uh, there's one. Let's see if somebody has, um, nope, that was answered. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> I'm not going to take a day off if caregivers can't take a day off. I mean, I'll take a, a portion of it off, but my heart goes out to, to all you as caregivers because I can appreciate the challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Again, I will share, share this information with, with Wellspring, but please, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide with you my email right here. I'm going to type it into the chat, okay? Just give me a moment. Uh, and I want you to please feel free to email me. If you have any concerns, any questions, any way that I could be of a support uh, you, it's rshami at kensingtonhealth.org. Uh, please feel free to to get in touch with me, and and I'll be happy to uh, to uh, to support you in that regard. Together, walk in together, support one another, aligned, sharing information, sharing knowledge, being creative. That's how we're going to get through this, folks. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Ruth Ann, I appreciate that. And I just wanted to mention one more time: um, the website is called. Uh, OntarioCaregiver.ca. I missed the word in there. My apologies. It's OntarioCaregiver.ca. I'm going to, again, write that in the chat. All right. If there's no other questions and no other comments, thank you very much for joining us today. This is recorded. Um, so it will be on the Wellspring website and uh, I hope you all stay safe and stay well and thank you again for joining us and thank you for all that you do as caregivers. Take good care.